Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Hi. Hey. Um, so I just wanted to first thank the uh, the organizers um, of the conference um, for you know having us out here, uh, flying me out from Seattle uh, to this beautiful island. It's awesome. Um, the games are all wonderful. Uh, it's been really great to you know exact um, pitiless judgment on all of them. So that's cool. Um, all right, so this talk is called World, Ga World Games Are Complicated. Um, as you can see, uh, this is me. Um, I'm a game designer. You can contact me there if you like. I'm also um, on Twitter for what it's worth, uh, which is not much. Um, and, you know, so that's cool. Um, <clears throat> okay, on to the talk. Uh, so I work for a company called Eline Media. Um, Eline calls itself a, an entertainment and education publisher. Uh, we focus on games. And a big part of our um, ideological underpinnings uh, could be represented by a concept called the double bottom line. Um, and this sounds like uh, gross uh, business jargon, and it kind of is. But um, basically, it means that everything Eline does has to meet two requirements, um, or bottom lines. And the, the first one uh, is the one you've heard of. Um, it's money. Um, you know, Eline sets out to make money to support um, itself and, and sustain itself and its partners, which is cool. Uh, the second is social good, uh, which is, you know, uh, it's vague. Um, Paolo Perrucini pointed out at a Games for Change conference a year or two ago um, that, you know, the meaning of the terms social good and change that get um, thrown around a lot at, at events like that um, are kind of, you know, they're in the eyes of the beholder. Um, so I'll try and be more specific about what we mean by that. Um, we've made, uh, at Eline, we've made, we've collaborated on, and we've published uh, a bunch of different things. We're kind of all over the place. Um, so this is GameStar Mechanic. Um, it's a game and a tool for teaching kids how to uh, make games. Um, it's used in classrooms, uh, largely middle school classrooms around the world. Um, I worked on this for uh, a couple of years. Uh, we have Historia, um, which is a, a game that's used uh, to teach history in classrooms. Um, this is Minecraft EDU. Uh, it's a tool uh, that teachers can use um, to help uh, uh, give them tools to use Minecraft in classrooms. Um, and of course, we made Never Alone, which is uh, why I'm here. So, on the you know off chance that you're not familiar with Never Alone, I actually brought the trailer. Uh, when we were testing this earlier, uh, it ran an ad before, so hopefully that won't happen. Oh, it is going to happen. That's great. <laughs> so this talk is brought to you by whatever this is. Try the new sparkling Festus. It's totally upside down.
So, Never Alone is, um, it's an atmospheric puzzle platformer, that's sort of the genre that we call it, um, as you can see. And it's a, it's a game that was built, built in partnership with the um, Inupiat community of Northern Alaska. Um, and it's based on their traditional stories. And at Eline, we call Never Alone our first world game. Um, and we'll have more on what that means uh, later in the talk, but for now, uh, let's no get ready for some ethnography. All right, so the Inupiat are uh, an Alaska Native people, uh, one of seven major indigenous groups that have uh, been living in Alaska for thousands of years. Um, and uh, this is where they live, um, so way up north. Um, you know, and, and they, uh, they lived a subsistence lifestyle um, for, for all that time. Uh, they lived in small groups of uh, extended families um, centered on hunting. And they'd move many times a year to follow the migrations of animals and the movements of sea ice. So these small communities um, are highly cooperative. They had a profound respect for their environment. And you can see why pretty easily. Um, you know, they're utterly reliant on it to support themselves, but um, they're kind of living on a knife's edge. Uh, this is, you know, an incredibly harsh uh, environment. It's one of the harshest ones that the, the, this world has to offer. Um, and they, you know, they developed incredible skills uh, of navigation and hunting and reading their environment, um, the movements of migratory animals, the, the formations and movements of sea ice. Um, their sea lore, or their ice lore is uh, incredibly deep. And what they didn't have, though, was writing. Um, and so for these thousands of years uh, of you know, history and experience, um, their stories, their myths, their beliefs, uh, and their, their practices were all um, passed down in an oral tradition. And so um, the elders in this society are kind of the repositories of knowledge. They, they sort of represent um, and embody you know, the knowledge and the wisdom of their people. Um, and you know, they represent sort of the, the worldview uh, of the Inupia, and that is still true today. Um, and so it's this oral tradition that Never Alone draws on. Uh, it's very much inspired by it. So, in Never Alone, you play as a uh, young Inupiaq girl, as you saw, and an Arctic fox, um, as they set out to find the source of an unending blizzard, um, which threatens the survival of their village. And this is based on a story called Kanuk Sayuka, um, which is told by this man, Robert Cleveland, um, who is a master storyteller. And um, he is, since uh, he passed away uh, years ago, but we, we uh, licensed the story um, from his family. Um, and we worked with uh, his family and the community at large to make sure that we embodied um, Inupiaq values uh, like cooperation and respect um, as we developed the game. And we're able to do this, of course, because um, the Inupiaq community still exists. Um, it's important to remember this, um, and Westerners often forget it, uh, that you know, today the Inupiaq are a modern culture. Um, they've adopted you know, modern tools and technologies uh, into their lives, and, and you know, they're prolific users of social media. Um, and in places like Barrow, which is the, northern, the absolute northernmost part of Alaska, uh, You'll see, let me see here. So it's the very northernmost tip of Alaska. Um, up there, you know, there exists a way of life that is a kind of unique blend of, um, you know, modern lifestyle that we're used to with technology and the internet and everything, but also a, a reliance on um, hunting and, and uh, th these traditional ways of life. So, that's a little context. Um, there's way more to say about the Inupiaq, obviously. Um, I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards, but actually what this talk is more about is our process. So first, um, I'll get into how Never Alone itself came to be, and then you know, more generally about world games, um, what they are, what we sort of see them as, and some of the problems involved with creating them. So <clears throat> there's an Alaska Native organization. So this is how, how this... Uh, game came to be. There's an Alaska Native organization called the Cook Inlet Tribal Council. Um, they've been around for like 30 years, and um, they've been doing a lot for the Alaska Native community. 
Um, they do education work, uh, work training, uh, child and family services, um, addiction recovery programs, things like that. Um, and you know, they've been working with the Alaska Native community for a long time. Uh, in 2012, they wanted to sort of branch out and reach out to the broader world. So um, there were a number of reasons to want to do this, right? Um, the first one, you remember this slide, uh, was revenue and economic development. Um, so, you know, it's a commercial game, so proceeds from the game can go back to CITC to uh, expand their programs and help the community. Um, the second is to speak to the world. Um, you know, the Inupiaq have long been pretty invisible. Most people have not heard of them. Uh, and there's a feeling that the sort of globalized Western uh, monoculture could use a few more perspectives. The third is representation. Um, so, you know, when Native people are portrayed at all in mass media, uh, which is not often, they're often reduced to racist stereotypes and caricatures, and as a result, the, the kids in these communities uh, who are consuming this media along with the rest of us, they don't get to see good representations of themselves. Um, and so having some control over the way you're represented uh, is a hell of a thing. So. So it happened that uh, Gloria O'Neill, um, who is the CEO of CITC, was talking with a lot of people about ways to share uh, her culture. And um, she eventually met Alan Gershenfeld, uh, who's the president of Eline. And by this time, this was a, a few years ago, um, we had made most of that other stuff that I'd showed you. So we, we had been in this sort of Games for Change um, space. And in fact, he's talking at the Games for Change Festival. Um, and uh, so, you know, they got to talking, and basically, Gloria wanted to share uh, her people's culture. Um, and she figured that the best way to do that would be with the most, uh, the biggest and most rapidly expanding and widely shared uh, medium in the world, uh, which is video games. Um, and so, this resonates with the community uh, up in Alaska because, you know, while many of the traditions and the language has suffered uh, erosion, you know, while that's happening, the kids in these communities are like the kids anywhere else. They're playing tons of games. Um, so they're already, you know, paying attention to that. So Eline and CITC um, start making connections. And people from Eline, uh, this is the creative director, Sean Beshi, um, with uh, Minnie Gray, who's uh, the daughter of um, Robert uh, Nostro Cleveland, uh, who I showed you before. Um, People from our company would go up to Alaska, we would bring people down to Seattle, where our studio is, and, um, and it, it, we sort of started building a relationship with this community. Um, and the, the purpose of that was to, from the ground up, build the game um, with their input. So the character designs, the, uh, the gameplay, the way the levels are laid out, the way the story is told, um, all comes from our collaboration with the community. Um, and if you want more technical details about the, uh, the, the process of making Never Alone, we have an excellent postmortem uh, from the lead designer, uh, Grant Roberts, um, on Gama Sutra, so you should check that out. So part three, world games. Um, Elon calls Never Alone its first world game. Um, but what is a world game? I've wondered about this a lot myself. I've racked my brain about this. Um, what we actually mean when we say world games. So by way of analogy, um, let's talk about something more familiar, uh, world music as a concept, which has been around since um, the 60s. And it was originally, <coughs> excuse me, it was originally um, conceived of as a kind of idealistic term. So world music uh, was kind of thought of as, um, you know, all of the music in the world. Uh, and it also spoke to a desire to broaden uh, your horizons to, to experience more music. Um, in the 80s, it turned into more of a marketing term, um, which is not that surprising. Uh, pardon me for a sec. So, Jesus, hold on, sorry, my phone is a, a disaster. Here we go. Um, so this raises some questions. Uh, the first one is, when we're talking about broadening people's horizons with something like world music or world, world games, um, who are we talking about? Whose horizons are we trying to expand? 
Second, when, why do we need a term for world music um, when, if it means all of the music in the world? Because uh, we already have a word for that. Um, so the answer to both of these is that in practice, world music generally refers to music from everywhere um, except, you know, these places. Um, and also except for, you know, musical styles that have adopted enough Western sounds and uh, uh, production um, so that they, they've developed their own distinct identity in the West. So, you know, here I'm thinking of, uh, there's a bunch of artists like uh, Spoke Motombo and William Onyabor, um, and also genres like uh, K-pop, uh, which is like largely produced here, um, which you know don't fit into this this category. Um, so what world music ends up becoming is not exactly non-Western music, but non-Western canon-based music, um, which is pretty close to meaning indigenous music. So world music as a category is kind of inextricable from a divided and Western-centric view of the world. Um, it, it seems to contain in its definition a kind of marginalized quality, right? And it, the music um, is separate, is considered to be separate from Western sensibilities and not directly participating in the kind of Western culture that surrounds it. And because of this, some people see, today see the term world music as a brand implying a second-class genre, um, kind of a, a bargain bin for music that doesn't fit into more marketable categories. Um, David Byrne uh, wrote a really good article about that uh, exact subject. And this is you know, a pervasive conceptual divide, right? Other examples are uh, with the Academy Awards uh, in the US. They're ostensibly about outstanding achievements in film in general but it's more like outstanding achievements in American film uh, with best foreign language feature as the only real concession that the rest of the world makes uh, movies at all. And you, you know, you'll, you'll recall that uh, what parts of the world world music is referring to um, has a lot of overlap with concepts of like the first world and the third world, um, that kind of thing. So, it does have this sort of problematic quality. But on the other hand, uh, world music did a lot to popularize many musical acts from around the world that did not get exposure beforehand. And the conceptual division of you know, a world that is the basis um, of this term you know, reflects a very real imbalance of power. And everyone has to live in this kind of globalizing, westernizing world and we have an interesting situation today. You know, while other cultures are marginalized, they also have uh, increasing access and ties to the network that, in the, that the West uses to sustain itself. So part of what, you know, what Eline wants to do, excuse me, it's got a little preview there. So part of what Eline wants to do uh, you know, with World Games is not just to promote indigenous culture for the benefit of European and American tastes and interests. Um, you know, we want to uh, spread it out across the entire planet, um, reach as many cultures as possible. We've translated the game into uh, many languages and we're planning to continue doing that. Um, let me just catch up to where I was. Um, so, um, so, you know, part of what we're trying to do there is also uh, communicate to the kids in these indigenous communities, specifically, because they don't get represented um, in, in this broader culture. Uh, you know, they're assimilating into this globalized world, and why wouldn't they? Um, it's, it's like they're consumers of Western media, just like everyone else. Um, but they're not represented in that media, and this is kind of, we're trying to make a way to change that. So I'm going to read you a quote from Juno Diaz. He's a Dominican raised in New Jersey, like me, and he's the author of The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow, among other books. So here's the quote. Uh, you guys know about vampires? You know vampires have no reflections in a mirror? There's this idea that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror, and what I've always thought isn't that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror, it's that if you want to make a human being 
into a monster, deny them, at the cultural level, any reflection of themselves. And growing up, I felt like a monster in some ways. I didn't see myself reflected at all. I was like, yo, is something wrong with me? Is that the whole society seems to think that people like me don't exist? And part of what inspired me was this deep desire that before I died, I would make a couple of mirrors. That I would make some mirrors so that kids like me might see themselves reflected back and not feel so monstrous for it. And this kind of cuts through everything for me. A lot of the personal hang-ups, um, you know, personally, I can't look at Never Alone without seeing missteps uh, and mistakes, but seeing people light up when they hear the language that their grandmother spoke coming out of an Xbox is pretty unbelievable. Um, you know, we've heard people saying that Never Alone makes them feel proud to be native. And, you know, people are excited about this. We, we might outgrow the term world games someday, but from where I'm standing, I think it's got a bright future. Um, we have people from around the world coming to us and asking to collaborate with us. People from all over are also independently working on amazing projects. Um, there's a studio, Kiro O Games, in um, Cameroon that's working on some amaz amazing projects, uh, Lienzo in Mexico. And just this past GDC, uh, Rami Ishmael of Lambir gave a crash course in Arabic, which was really cool. And he announced a new project called GameDev.World, uh, which is going to aid the growth of games development in countries with large non-English speaking populations. Um, so there's all these different projects, um, it's all great stuff, and we're getting to be a small part of it, which is uh, an incredible privilege. So the fourth part of this talk is inclusive development. This is the actual practice. Um, so you know, we've called our, our approach to, to developing this game inclusive development. Um, CITC and Eline joined forces to form uh, Upper One Games, uh, in which developers work closely with members of the community um, to direct development of all aspects of the game. So this is the art, the characters, the levels, the story. Um, this involves a lot of traveling, sending developers up to Alaska, bringing people down. And you know, in general, this has worked really well. Uh, it was a pretty enlightening experience for everyone involved. But it was also new. We'd never done this before. No one's ever really done this. And there were a lot of challenges over the course of development. So I said world games are complicated. Um, so is the community, right? I've been talking about the Inupiat as a unit up until now. But consider literally any community you've ever been a part of, right? Your school, um, the, the game industry, your family. And you know that there's a lot of different opinions there. Um, there's a lot of sort of infighting and a lot of uh, uh, internal struggle. So there's no one representation of a community that's going to satisfy everyone, that's going to feel right to everyone. And people have different attitudes towards their traditions and how they've been preserved or how they feel they should be preserved. They have different religious beliefs, um, new and old. And they, they, there are those who go out whaling every year, uh, and there are those who live in big cities and still consider themselves a part of that community but have never gone hunting. So in Never Alone, you know, we could only set out to tell one specific story. And there was a lot of discussion about what that story should be and uh, you know, how it should be told. So it's not possible to represent every viewpoint in the game. Um, and sometimes you just have to let go and say, look, we'll just have to save this for the next game. And not everyone's happy with that, but that's what you end up having, having to do. So the collaboration that Upper One Games represents uh, involves finding and respecting everyone's area of expertise and everyone's knowledge. So you know, this ranges from storytelling and cultural knowledge and hunting knowledge to um, game design and art uh, and programming and so on. And so one area of expertise from the game industry side is that is what will resonate with the gaming audience or with the global audience, right? And so we have a lot of uh, industry veterans at our company who uh, have a lot of experience marketing games and bringing games to a, to a, a wide audience. This is kind of a double-edged sword, though. Uh, it means that we'll be able to reach more people, but on the other hand, we're also dealing with kind of culture clash and clashing values between 
uh, developers who are Western and uh, native people. So say you want to make a game, like we did, that will appeal to families, a game that, you could, that a, a parent could play with their child. Um, you know, we want to get nice and gentle uh, PEGI ratings and ESRB ratings. Um, but traditional stories in all cultures were not designed, were not written with rating systems in mind, um, thankfully. And, uh, you know, what you end up having to deal with is these stories that are quite dark. They're quite scary uh, a lot of the time. Um, they're disturbing to modern Western sensibilities and they don't seem like the kind of thing that you should be telling your kid all of the time. So there's different ways to depict them, of course. I mean, you look at you know, the Brothers Grimm fairy tales and how those have evolved in popular culture over time. Uh, and so there's different ways to sort of place emphasis um, on different aspects of the stories. And so we could and we did represent these stories in a way that would be you know, a bit more palatable. But it raises a question of what value set are we representing? Are we representing Inupiaq values or are we representing ESRB values or PEGI values? In the end, what we end up with is kind of a hybrid. It's a bridge between the cultures so that uh, the culture will not be too alienating um, and it will be inviting uh, to people, but it is still uh, a matter of compromise. The next part is false pattern recognition. So this is another um, major issue. When, and it's related to the previous one. When encountering a different culture, we bring a lot of our, our own hangups and our own history um, when we're encountering new things. We fill in a lot of gaps. Um, and so you know, we see things that we think we recognize and we assume that we know what's up. But this is an issue for both you know, the development team and for the audience at large. So, as, a, as an example, um, the Inupiaq community has uh, a pretty strong sense of gender roles, um, where it's mostly the men that hunt, and the women process the carcasses, and they sew the skins. Um, and my immediate association with that was like, you know, Mad Men. It's like the 1950s, really repressive uh, uh, society in America, this very hierarchical thing with men on top. Um, but that is me bringing a lot of baggage into uh, the Inupiaq community that, that wasn't there to begin with. Um, Inupiaq gender roles were never anywhere near as rigid um, as gender roles in the West. They were never nearly as hierarchical or systematically enforced. Um, and men and women, you know, women would hunt, men would sow. Um, these weren't the primary roles, but they were pretty common. Another example is you hear uh, of the Inupiaq practice of whaling. And I've seen a lot of people kind of freak out about that because their association is with uh, modern kind of industrial whaling practices. Uh, you see the, you know, the bays full of blood and whale bodies. The thing is, the Inupiaq have been whaling for something like 10,000 years. Um, their practice is much is clearly sustainable. Um, and it's, it's, it just doesn't have all the same implications um, that we immediately associate with these, these practices. You know, and all of this is not to say that you have to like defined gender roles or whaling, even as practiced by uh, an indigenous community. Um, but it is to say that you have to understand that you know, when you encounter this, you're filling in a lot of what you think is understanding. Um, with your own kind of cultural baggage and your own information. And so any aspect of a culture can be played up or down or omitted entirely and is going to have aspects on how those cultures are perceived. There's an unfortunate tension um, between wanting to represent a multifaceted uh, or well-rounded perspective or vision and ensuring that it's received fairly and on its own terms. So those are some of the difficulties. Uh, the next part is the power. So here's a quote from Ishmael Hope. He was the lead writer on the game. Uh, he is a Inupiaq and Tlingit storyteller. Um, and here's what he said about uh, working with people from the outside, his experiences. 
Those relationships are often called collaboration, but what that typically means is native people are advisors, and that's it. Uh, which is to say, this is about power. This is hard, and it's awkward to talk about. But the power balance is an important part of any relationship, and this is no exception. So internally, we pay attention to the power structures within our own organizations. You know, who's paying for what, who answers to whom. CATC has a major stake in E-Line, so we actually, as a development team, we answer to Gloria and the board of, uh, uh, of CITC. This also means that E-Line does not have the sole final say in what goes into the game and what does not, um, meaning that the community has ownership over their representation. But there's also a relationship with the world at large. Um, in a way, you know, this project is a form of assimilation. It's entering into the global gaming market. It's this culture entering into this global market um, with the product. And it's playing by the, you know, the rules of global capital. And for CITC, in a way, it's buying into a system in order to ensure they control their role in it. So the other, si other side of the power discussion is agency. The Inupiaq people are facing a lot of challenges, uh, like the erosion of their language and culture, but they are resilient, and they're doing much more than collaborating on video games. Uh, uh, and so, like, the point there is to not discount them as a people and to not discount their agency. I say this because when people talk about this kind of project, native collaborators' roles tend to be minimized. People say things like, their role was to share their culture with the developers, which kind of implies that then the developers like go and do all the work um, based on that. And that's not the nature of how we work. Um, you know, I, I basically like never alone the, the way that it often gets depicted uh, in articles, articles that are very positive towards what we're doing, very encouraging, is that we are saving a culture um, with this game, that we are helping to preserve it and rescue it. And Never Alone is not a bunch of guys like me swooping in to save or preserve a culture that's teetering on the brink of extinction. Um, you know, this is a trope that exists in Western media. Uh, it's called the white savior trope, um, where a white man fights the good fight uh, against an oppressive white institution on behalf of non-white people. And this is a struggle in which those non-white people have no agency. They're just pawns. They're the stakes in a struggle between white actors. And so last week, Ishmael said to me that Never Alone isn't a social justice game it's not going to get our sovereignty back. It's not going to save or preserve the Inupiaq people because the Inupiaq people have been saving and preserving themselves for over 10,000 years. Um, the CITC, the organization that we've partnered with, is an extension of that. And we are just a small part of that project. So people, focus on the story that surrounds Never Alone. But the thing that people miss is that what Never Alone is, at the end of the day, is art. It's an expression of the Inupiaq people and their collaboration with us. And it's an expression that has reached beyond the confines of niche interests and anthropology departments and into the global public eye. It's an expression that's reached down into the communities from which it came. And, you know, it's not perfect, but it's a start. It's their art, and it's our art, and it's a reminder that the Inupiaq do not stand apart from our world. They have been, they are, and they will always be a part of it. So, I wanted to end this talk with a cultural insight from our game. Uh, we have these, these videos uh, contained in our game that you will unlock as you play through it. One of the things I think a lot of people need to understand is we aren't a museum piece. 
the Inupiaq people are a living people and a living culture. Even though we're in northern Alaska, which covers this vast area from Nome all the way over the Canadian border, is that there is this extreme value of interconnectedness and interdependence. It's a hunting society, a gathering society, from thousands of years. This is what creates our culture. That special relationship between humans and the natural world and the animals, and that it teaches you how to have a, a society that doesn't do too much harm to the world. Love and respect for nature, for one another, for our elders, very, very fundamental value, key to, key to life. Our values are something that bind us all. The importance of sharing with one another, the importance of spirituality, and the connection to the land, our traditions, how we hunt, sharing of stories and songs and dances. I'm Inupiaq. I'm from the Arctic Ocean. Inupiaq Maruma. I am Inupiaq. It's very important to me. It's, it's who I am as a person. And we're very proud of who we are and we want to continue that. All right, that's it. So questions uh, are welcome. <clears throat>Hi, um, I've played Never Alone or part of it, and I think it's uh, really cool. I really like uh, experiences in different cultures and different perspectives, I otherwise wouldn't. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, but my question is, what is the next step uh, after represent letting a different culture that otherwise not known speak to the world, show the world uh, that they exist? What's the next step after that? So we have a number of different things that we're working on doing. I mean, the obvious, one obvious next step for us is to expand our game projects, um, to continue working with this community and, um, and building our relationship with them, building our collaboration with them. Because uh, right now we have this, we work with uh, select members, we work with certain uh, people and we're tr always trying to expand that. We're always trying to find more people uh, who we can work with. And like I said before, we make some compromises about what aspect of the culture we focus on. There are some people who um, care much more about uh, certain traditional beliefs, uh, religious beliefs. Um, there are other people who care much more about the hunting practices that are more commonly practiced up there. And so uh, being able to expand um, the games that we work on and the games that we develop collaboratively uh, by expanding the focus of them, the different aspects of the culture, we can sort of build a portfolio of games um, around the Inupiaq people and also other people that we reach out to or who have reached out to us um, to build a more uh, multifaceted um, perspective on who they are uh, in, in the in popular culture. Um, the other side of it is helping the community itself um, develop and support itself. And so part of that is uh, outreach programs, you know, bringing people uh, from the community um, into our studio in a more integrated way. Um, instead of flying people down for a bit, having them talk to everyone, recording our sessions, um, you know, going through uh, uh, sort of workshopping art and, and ideas, um, having them be even more integrated into the development team. Um, so that's, that's part of what we're doing. Um, would you uh, look at it in the way that each right, obscure culture, obscure is a harsh word, um, has its own developer or its own people that can help them give a voice. Uh, do you think that that's a route that we should take or um, do you think the further democratizing of game tools, uh, like 
will, is that the path forward or is it something in between? Yeah, I think, um, I think there's a bunch of different routes to take. So I mentioned um, gamedev.world, which is uh, striving to make basically a be a translation service for um, game making tools and documentation and things like that um, for people you know, who do not speak English um, when that is the most prevalent thing. I think that's a great strategy. Um, there are also game studios that are starting up um, in places that have never had game studios before, uh, like Cameroon. Um, and that is also a really exciting development. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that I think is the most empowering for people is, you know, what we've done as a first step is show people that there is an interest in their culture, show people that, you know, their culture can be depicted um, in this way. But I think what is going to be much more empowering is for more people uh, to be able to represent themselves in an even more direct way. So in our case, you know, we have a studio um, and we have a process that is very collaborative, but I think uh, you know, using tools like, um, that, that are much more accessible, like Game Maker or Twine even, um, and bringing those to these communities and, and saying, you know, well, you are, you're storytellers, but you're also interested in games. Uh, Let's teach you how to use Twine in an afternoon and you know, get more games, get more voices in games. Um, that would be wonderful for me, so, and I think for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So I was curious, you said you had to compromise. Yep. Uh, can you go into it a bit more? Like, uh, was there something that you, in the game, that they found a bit some in the community felt a bit uh, offended by, or was there some gameplay options that, or game, game design choices that you had to cut? And yeah, so uh, when I talk about compromise, part of that is, is not so much between, um, well, to some extent, with the, the, what I was talking about with Peggy, versus, Peggy values versus Inupiaq values, um, some of that is like, in terms of depiction. Um, we, we'll keep a story in, but we'll change how it's, uh, or we won't, we won't depict it to the fullest extent that we could. So as an example, um, in the trailer you saw those, uh, I don't know if you've played the game, but you, you see the, these sort of green creatures flying down from the sky. And that's based on a story that we heard from Ishmael um, that his mother would tell him when he was younger. And, uh, she would say, um, she would talk about the northern lights, the, the aurora, and she would say that um, when the lights are out, when the northern lights are out, and you go outside, make sure you put your hood up on your parka, because what the northern lights are, are the, the spirits of dead children who have risen up into the sky, and uh, if they see your bare head, they'll swoop down and rip it off of your body and play soccer with it <laughs> in the sky. So that was something, we have those people, we have those creatures in the game, but we don't have an animation of the girl's head being ripped off and you know, kicked around in the sky. Um, and that was the kind of thing where it's a tough decision to make uh, when you want to depict something but you're not sure exactly how to do it and what gets at the spirit of the thing versus what is too much of a compromise. Um, ultimately, it has to be down to the community, which brings me to the other kind of compromise, which is compromise between opinions that are different in the community. So, as an example, um, there were some people uh, in the community who uh, were not, they were excited about the game, they were interested in the game, but they wanted more of a focus on some of the traditional practices. Um, and we were focused more on the story. Now, what we can do in that case is try and expand, like as we develop more games in the future, um, expand into that area that, that other people were interested in and try and broaden um, 
the range of things in the culture that we're depicting. We were specifically trying to be very narrow um, in this game, but of course, you know, the narrower we get, the more sort of uh, um, true to a particular story we can be, the more focused we can be. And so when we say, well, we can't include this thing that you want in the game, there's a reason for it. You know, it's, it's scope creep, basically. Um, so part of, part of what, you know, what helps to keep a good perspective on something like this is seeing it as an ongoing project, that this game is not the be all and end all great representation of, uh, of a particular culture. It's just an aspect of it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, I have a question. Um, it seems to me that in addition, like you kind of talked a little bit about this in one of the previous uh, questions, uh, but that to have uh, game development tools, um, ma like, you know, on education, make them available to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's great. However, like, I think you're aware that Eli, and one of the things you guys bring to the table is that you are seasoned developers, and also you have specifically Western sensibilities, and you know how to take these stories, um, e even though, the, you know, the, the involvement um, that the community had was quite great um, in the writing and like there was much more direct and the, you know the power shifts were correct and whatnot and everything was great. Um, you have a certain leg up in actually presenting these communities to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess what I'm wondering is like, do you get daily calls now from other communities that like want your services? And then just in general, like, what do you think about that? And if you if there was a culture out there that really wanted um, to, you know, do their own, uh, make, you know, take a stab at it themselves, like, what would you recommend to them? Take a stab at it themselves as in, like, but, not collaborating, but actually forming their own studio completely independently? Yeah, and, and well, it's specifically not, you know, like, for instance, um, I don't know if Ishmael, like, realized that, like, oh, you know, that story about your head gets ripped off and then they, they play soccer and say, maybe, maybe there's a culture that is not aware that that would be, tough to sell in the Western, <laughs> sure, you know, sure. whatever. And well, they actually make a game like that, even if it's, it has the high production values and things yeah. like, you know. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I mentioned is that there, there is a, a sort of sense um, that isn't spoken about too much, but there is a sense of um, uh, almost assimilation in, in this process of making a game, uh, sort of translating your uh, aspects of your culture or a traditional story into something that ends up being a product, you know, on Steam or what have you. Um, and that is a translation, you know, I think part of what made Never Alone successful was that there were people from both sides of that divide working on it and who wanted to, to make it the best that it could be and reach the most people. Um, you know, I think it, it, part of that expertise is just, based on um, experience with experience with you know the the gaming market and the um, knowing what people are hungry for and what they're willing to be like in what ways they're willing to be challenged in what ways um, maybe they aren't and sort of hopefully building them up to be more and more willing to be more open and more challenged by more things. Um, for a developer that is completely um, independent, I mean, they would, have, they would just need to do a lot of research. Um, and I would reach out to, you know, to me or to people I work with or to people who are doing similar things and just ask for advice. You know, if one of the things that we want to do is help, um, and it, part of that is this, you know, is, is making deals and making new games and new projects and things like that, but another part of that is just reaching out into the community and um, offering to, you know, help whoever needs it, uh, whether it be with, you know, learning tools or learning how to get word out. Cool, thanks. I have one follow-up. Um, 
What uh, do you, uh, how did you, I guess, decide to, or how did Eline decide to kind of partner with this particular community? And, um, you know, like uh, if you are being maybe contacted now by all kinds of um, cultures all over the world that, that don't yeah. get representation, how do you choose with whom to work? So that's largely a, so with, with um, Eline, uh, or sorry, with CITC uh, in particular, um, the idea came from CITC originally. So they were the initiators. Um, they have a major stake in Eline, so they're on our board of directors. So it, it became this very kind of integrated um, project. Now, it's not always going to work like that, of course. Um, but CITC happened to be in a position where they had the resources and they had the connections um, to be able to go to events like Games for Change and, and talk to people there. Um, you know, other communities don't necessarily have that advantage. Um, so it's partially, you know, it's partially finding people come to us and they have these, um, they have things that they want to do. And personally, like, I'm not comfortable with being like a gatekeeper, but it still has to make sense for CITC, who's going to be in partnership, uh, and Eline, um, to make the game and to, to, to get it out there. So I think, you know, in the short term, it has, uh, it's going to be more conservative uh, in terms of like who we work with and what they can bring to the table in terms of funding the game and partnership with the game. Um, in the long term, we hope to be able to reach out to people who don't have those resources and don't have those organizations that can um, you know, vouch for them and back this kind of project. Um, but that's, you know, that's part of a much larger strategy than just Never Alone. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Hello, again. Hey. Um, how do you, uh, like you, you talk about the, one, the white man saving the people without agency from the white man. Sure. Um, part of the process for you must be quite heavily uh, like invested in making sure that you're not like the, you're not the white people just coming in, saving these cultures from the white culture. Right. Uh, and how do you keep that in check? So part of that is structural. Um, part of our solution to that uh, problem is that we are, um, in terms of the way our organization is actually structured, um, we are answering to people in the community. So we are not, for me, I was not the lead designer on Never Alone, but had I been, I would still would not have been the final word on design. So that's part of it. The other part is just sort of checking your privilege um, and, and being open to uh, having it checked by people from the community. Um, you know, you, you definitely have people who come into the project who, you know, were hired in later who don't have the complete picture and they, um, and it takes a while to kind of get acclimated to the values and, and um, the sort of perspectives on, uh, uh, you know, animals, for instance. Like, there's an immediate thought in most Western people's minds about, um, you know, wolves being a scary enemy monster creature thing. Uh, there are no Inupiaq stories with, like, evil wolves. This is, like, not really a thing. So when you're sort of brainstorming and talking with people, you know, someone will be like, oh, you could have a wolf that's, like, dangerous or something. And you have to make sure that you're including um, people from the community in these discussions, because if you don't, then you're going to you know, you're going to start going down this path that is completely unfounded and not based on anything. And you have to just end up with, um, you have to develop your sense of humility to some extent. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a long and complicated process and we're always getting sort of uh, working with, with um, people like Ishmael and, and Ron Brower um, has been super instructive because uh, they've been more patient than they need to be. 
Um, and we really do appreciate that from them. Um, but they're also, you know, willing to, to call us out when we think we're doing, you know, when we think we're doing something, but we really have no idea. Thanks. Thank you. Any other takers?